Hello uh, everyone watching on YouTube and everyone listening on Spotify. It's another episode of the NRG Insights today, which is where we speak to successful business owners about the, how they've got to where they are and the, pit, the pitfalls and successes of, um, of owning a mortgage brokerage. So today I've got Steve Hand from Express Mortgages. So thanks for joining me, Steve. You're very welcome. Hi, everyone. And if we, let's just start with, um, give us a vague round of, you just tell me about your, your kind of, your Express Mortgages journey, how you got to where you are at the moment. Yeah, wow. Um, so in 2000, I started in Mortgage World. Uh, I worked for someone for four years as a commission only mortgage advisor, which was, which was great grounding. At the time I had two jobs on the table. One was a guaranteed salary with a bit of bonus. One was commission only, but the commission only potential was, was twice as much. And I was living with mum and dad and I said to my mum at the time, what, what do you reckon mum, which one shall I go for? And, uh, and she said, well, Steve, you know, you've always got a roof over your head. So if you want to take the riskier option, that that's up to you. So I kind of wanted us to say that because that was the exciting one. That's the one you wanted. Do you actually, just right, Steve, do you think that's relevant to where you are now? Because I, I had to talk to people this morning. I was saying to some new business starts, I was saying like, you've already done the hard bit in regards to growing a business. You've done the bit, you've taken the step out of your comfort zone. Do you think, yeah. do you think that's relative to the fact of, um, you know, sort of building your business the way you've done it? Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely one of the elements because um, I, I appreciated from a younger age, I might have been like mid-twenties there, I'm 47 now, so I appreciated that, you know, with risk comes reward potentially. Mm. And uh, also, I had a great teacher in my old man, in, in good ways and bad. So one of the things with my dad was, love him to bits, he's no longer with him, God rest his soul, with us, God rest his soul. But one of the things that he kept saying, you know, you, you have these, these words that you hear from parents was, play it safe, play it safe. And, and that sticks out in my mind because it's that typical sort of lower middle class family that I grew up in where you didn't yeah. really have much, but you, you were brought up with all these nice morals and all the rest of it. And I thought, do you know what? I want more than this out of my life. I, I don't want yeah. this life. So I, and you know what, when people, say, when people say play it safe to you, they're not being mean. Like your family, that's why I always say to people when they set up a business, like ask your mentors and, and ask people who have done it. Probably don't ask your mum and dad because yeah. they're going to they care for you too much. Yeah. You know, and it is risk. Really, so, you know, play it safe is just being nice, isn't it? It's not. I know, I want exactly. And I think he was just trying to look after me. But so I, I yeah. thought to myself, no, you, you've, got to, you've got to be bold. If, if you want things out of life, no one's going to hand it to you. You've got to go for it yourself. So. Yeah, I thought with that job, that initial position, I'll, I'll take that. And and uh, unfortunately, the, the owner, Stuart, gave me the, the role and, and off I went. And then he trusted in me after about 18 months by giving me the job of manager of the Birmingham branch. I, I was in the Liverpool yep. branch at the time. And I think it's just because I was always taught to be competitive. One thing about my old man was he was very competitive. He was uh, he ran for his county in athletics and, and played rugby and stuff. So that, that was like drilled into me. Had an older brother that helped me with competitiveness. And then I thought, do you know, I, I want, I'm going to go for this position because um, as manager of a, of a branch, I've got the, the opportunity to, to shine and, and bring this branch up to, to where it should be. And so uh, I did that for a few years. And then eventually after the four years, I decided with them, um, a guy who was my manager at the time, area manager, Paul, uh, to set up a brokerage, and we did in 2004. So, little shop in the middle of uh, Wigan, and uh, in the northwest, and uh, that was doing residential mortgages and a few buy to lets, and then we just grew from there. So, um, I guess it introduced. So how did that, how did that transition then? How did the how did that transition if you started off as resi brokers? It's, um, well, we, we started off from scratch, um, which, which I guess all entrepreneurs like to say, don't they? Oh, we did it all ourselves, but yeah. we, we started- Six quid in pocket. Yeah, no, no money <laughs> on the bread line. But um, no, it, it was good fun. It was a good, uh, very good grounding. You know, we, we had to make it work. It was one that you, you've got to, haven't you? And, and we were leaving yeah. positions where we were well paid. You know, we're in that era of 2000 to 2007, sorry, 2000, 2004 where good there was, money yeah there was self cert mortgages there was adverse you know the money was sloshing around so we were leaving probably like at least three times average salary to, to do this we had yeah. to make it work and um yeah we, we started off there we had the rent to pay and all the rest of it but we, we grew our introducers fairly quickly and that that was key so we had strong relationships with accountants ifas estate agents and we managed um 
not by design, but we managed to get a lot of uh, investors through that because of the introducers that we had on board. And yep. So we dealt with a lot of landlords, of course, repeat business, repetition, good referrals, uh, and built it up from there. And we had three strong years before the crap hit the fan when... Uh, you remember the 2008, you know, I always talk about this in that podcast when it's when everyone goes, and then, yeah, and then 2008 yeah. happens. Well, t- 2007, remember the queues outside of Northern Rock? Yeah. I remember, I think it was September 2007, and uh, that was the start of the downfall, if you like, in, or the uncertainty. And then Lehman's yeah. Brothers, the year later in 2008, um, that, that, just, that yeah. yeah. And do you know what, Marcus? I, I remember I'd already booked this holiday, this holiday in Ireland, I think it was... Um, either 2008 or 9, I think it was 2009, and I was playing golf at this place. I, I, I treated myself to a fancy course this day, and it's one of those where they tee you up with other people, and I was with this American guy who was a journalist for the um, the New York Times, and he, yeah. he felt the need to apologise to me on behalf of America because he, he <laughs> knew what game I was in. And yeah, he, he apologised to me for, for the downfall of the uh, you know the financial <laughs> situation. He said sorry for what's coming, and you were like blissfully unaware. I'm playing golf. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk to me. I'm trying to concentrate. You know, it's, um, th- that was that was a really tough period. Obviously, anyone that that's been in business will have known. Um, it was a combination of the Great Recession and the credit crunch, and it probably for three years or something like that. You know, it was. Mm. Um, because you had direct deals coming from lenders, so residential mortgages, you were competing with the people you're placing business with. The lender was ridiculous, yeah. It, yeah, it was mental. And then you, with buy to let, you had the Mortgage Works and Birmingham Midshires, I think they were the main two at one point, um, yeah. who you could send business to. So it was, um, yeah, that we had to unfortunately let go of a couple of staff. We got from Paul and myself that um, set the business up to five of us, and then we, we scaled back down to three and just yep. clung on by our, our teeth for a few years. And then we scaled up again, I think it was 2011. We, we, we moved it on upwards from there. I mean, oh, so not, not too long in the doldrums. We, you know, I was talking to someone the other day about it, and they were saying, obviously, if you weren't in 2008, I know I sound like an old man every time I say this, because it comes up a lot on the podcast, because obviously just the nature of the age of people with own businesses, but um, people are saying how similar, it, they, how they felt like it over Q4 last year. And I said, if you feel like that, you honestly weren't there. It's like an old Vietnam story. Because I said, there's money now. There's not, wasn't, there was no money. It yeah. was completely different. There was literally people were hanging on for dear life. Yeah. What, Whereas what we mad, had a three-month blip. Yeah, what was mad was you were getting the inquiries in, which, uh, which is testament to, to those of us that were around. You know, clients yeah. still wanted to do business with us, but there wasn't anything to, to give them at the end of it, in a lot of cases. So, so that was, mm. yeah, it, it was. It, but, it, of course, these things mate you, don't they? And then from 2011 yeah. afterwards, uh, we, we spent a lot of money with Money Supermarket and, and other lead providers for about five yeah. years. I think we spent about 500 grand in five years just building up the database. Uh, we got a lot of inquiries from the southeast because London generally comes out of recessions first. So there was, yeah. Um, the, yeah, there was a lot of good clients coming from there. And, uh, and we took on a business partner, which uh, I can't really say too much about because it went through litigation. <laughs> But All right. <laughs> we I, can, I can say this. But we'll bleep anything out that we need to. This does get yeah. edited. <laughs> no, for so we we had a strong spell from 2011 to 15, building up, and then 15 to 20. That was a, a direct uh, dispute era, if you like, in in my memory, uh, which, right. which ended in three years of litigation, which. Uh, I, I wouldn't wish on anyone. It's um, it's a it's a very that's tough, isn't it? Like yeah. keeping your get, any distraction in business is hard, yeah. even if it's a couple of weeks. Yeah. So that sort of distraction. I mean, what does that do for you? Well, Obviously, mentally, but I mean, business wise, how was that for you? Just do you to... know, like a lot of us in this industry, I'm very much a numbers man. So you look at it like with the left side of the brain, and you kind of go, right, that cost us this much in lawyers' fees. Like lawyers' fees are ridiculous. Anyone that's been through a divorce or anything like that. It's, you're just hemorrhaging money, but it's also yeah. it's the um, it's the business that you've not done because you're all fighting and you know not moving forward. Yeah. you can't even work out the ROI on the or, or the, the the loss, can you? From no. The, um, so I mean, we, from we, what you didn't do, we have put about a million quid on it for that fi- uh, for yeah for five years. The dispute, not moving forward, and the legal battle because um, it, it it threatened to go to high court and all that, which was ridiculous for the size of us. 
But yeah, it would have yeah. cost us getting on for or around a million quid, which wow. some people will wallow in self-pity with that, but I'm just not that type of person. I might give myself a slap round the chops or you know, I'll, I'll do something to get myself back on track, but I just yeah. won't wallow there because I'm, I'm not going to allow a situation to, to bury me. Um, how do you how do you do that that in regards to kind of mindset what do you do because people are going to come not a million quid for everyone but people do get up to those distracting i mean i've had it with people with their networks where they refuse to put business through and i think you're killing your business yeah because you've had the dispute with net you know etc so what do you, how do you get out of that mindset wise and um just kind of to spring out of it because it, like you say it could cripple some people oh yeah um I, do you know I've, I've always loved sport and i've always um I'm one of these people that I'll watch the, the best. So some people don't like Tiger Woods because, you know, for, for many years he was like the pinnacle, wasn't he? But won everything. I get off on watching the best in each in each field. It's just what I do. So yeah. I, I like watching interviews as well. So I like watching the game or, or the round and I like watching what they say afterwards and studying the mindset of the great. So I try and take something from these people and think, well, they're where they are because of their mind predominantly. Obviously, they've got a yeah. strong talent and skill, but the reason that they're right at the top is is it the mental um, battle that they've overcome. So I'll I'll look at that and I'll um, I'll try yeah I'll try and utilize some of that in my own world. And um, also, what's helped me a lot in recent times is uh, is yoga and meditation. You know, I, yeah. I used to um, be an athlete myself, uh, rugby, and um, that was it. Proper rugby or rugby league. <laughs> <laughs> it was rugby league. Come on, I grew up in St. Helens. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. He wouldn't, yeah. Apart from, he don't get any union up there from Newcastle, maybe. But, uh... Yeah, but no, I've, I've played both and I love watching both. I'm, I'm not one of yeah. these people that will just favour one code. Um, I, I love watching league as well. I was only joking, by the way. I, I play union, but I love I love watching the just, I mean, it's my sort of rugby. It's just get up and run at someone and stop and run again. You know, <laughs> you know, the thing I love more than anything, and I wasn't a big lad, I, I love tackling. It's just, yeah. I think you go through that era as a, as a, as a guy where um, you've just got to excess testosterone. You need to put it to good use. So, um, yeah. yeah. Although I played two games a weekend this weekend, I found out I don't have excess. <laughs> I'm very drained. <laughs> it's absolutely killed me. I'm in a bit, but, uh, you know. Marcus, You're in, in my head, I'm still 20, but um, my 40 year old body was not running around like Fair, fair play, <laughs> mate. Fair play. No, I, I think just having little niggles and injuries here, I, I decided in my 20s that it was it was time, really. I think you, you just get to a point where you get you get injured quite a bit, and uh, and that was a sign for me to, to do something else, which golf then took I think play. everyone says you play one game of rugby uninjured, don't you? That's your first game. And the rest of it's just maintenance. Just oh, sort of exactly, <laughs> exactly. But no, the, the thing I think what came from that is that um, I did have chronic hamstring problems, like my, my right mm. one from a calf injury I had, and uh, and that drew me to yoga. Uh, and yeah. not the type of bloke that would normally do that. You know, when my wife suggested yoga to me, I went on a, a hard five mile fast run because I thought <laughs> I've, I've got to do some exercise before this awesome stretch. Even out. Yeah, but. <laughs> For the first 20 minutes, my arms were shaking like that in downward dog, and I thought, this is a different kind of strength. Yeah. And um, no, I really I really enjoyed that. So on and off, I've done yoga for 10 years, and meditation helps massively uh, because it gives you that space between stimulus and response. So I think mm. for me personally, I'll, I'll always keep up some kind of meditation practice, yoga practice, and then... Do you regularly do meditate? Is you Have you got a set time to meditate, or do you just do it when you're stressed, or do you try and do it before like how, how was your kind of habits with that I, i'm one of these annoying people um that, that gets up at five o'clock every day <laughs> that's not annoying we will annoy everyone that doesn't i don't i i always say this i get up really early um but I, it's the most contentious issue forget politics um you know religion race anything like that wake up time seems to frustrate people the most if you wake up late, it really angers people that you get up early. I'm not I'm never sure why. I said, I, I just, I go to bed at a different time. It's not the end of the world. I don't know why people are so frustrated. No, and it, I think it's just, maybe we have a natural tendency, don't we, to either get up early or, or stay up late or whatever. But yeah. for me... Well, there's a physiological thing in there. There's the, 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 the Skylark and Night Owl uh, mm -hmm. thing where you just, some people are built like that. Yeah, but do you know what? I love, I love sunrise more than anything. So mm. especially sort of May, June, July, that, 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 time of the year I love getting up yeah. early seeing the sunrise uh, climbing mountains that that kind of stuff so I find it really peaceful in the morning doing uh, 
So I have like a little personal practice each morning. And then uh, I, I do train as well, but I, my training consists of a bit of running, a bit of yoga, a bit of weights, and just kind of mix it about a bit like that. Yeah. Do you find that helps you headspace wise? Yeah, yeah. I think the um, I'm a big fan of like the endorphins running through the body. So um, I, I do the cold showers and stuff, all but the ice baths as well because I, I, yeah. I like the dopamine rush that you get from it. Um, yeah, but I'm a big. I've, I've, I've been reading something recently about the flow of the chemicals and how you how you keep them going. It's very true, isn't it? Yeah. There's a reason why you can stay in flow on some things and, and some things not. It's just it's just, and it's literally a flow of chemicals going, <laughs> just releasing. Make sure you're releasing them at the right times. Yeah, de definitely. But I think um, like there's a, there's a podcast I listen to, Carl Morris, who's a, who's a golf performance coach. He's from the Northwest, Carl. And uh, yeah, I think one of the things he says is um, you, you've got to find your own way. You know, you, you've got yeah. to, um, where you put your attention is important. But what, what I do isn't right for everybody. It's not right for, you know, for a whole load of people. And um, you, you've just got to trial and error, I think, and find what works for you and then stick in that groove and, and continue with it. And I think when yeah. you've found that, you, you just find a level of peace that you you know that that that's really fulfilling. So for, for me, yeah. I've got to, and it's not, to, I'm not a monk, you know, I still like the odd wine and beer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I was at Leeds Rugby League on Friday night, and I had a, a few wines, but I, I think it's a lot less so these days. And, um, yeah. you know, that the... I find, well, I stopped drinking, but and that was purely uh, like an underachieving thing. And that wasn't like an excessive drinking, it was just... It was getting in the way of my habits, and my habits are things that make my business better. So yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing it, but also if you're all or nothing like me, I don't, you might as uh, you might as well be nothing, you know? Because it, it just yeah. if it if it um, hinders you in any way, I yeah. think is uh, is a well, big thing. Did you ever watch that on Netflix, The Last Dance with Michael Jordan and uh, Yes, all about the balls. So like, yeah, yeah. M Michael was pretty disciplined, wasn't he? he? Didn't really drink, as far as I'm aware, while while he was at the balls. But then, um, yeah. you see the fella Dennis Rodman. Uh, yeah, just done it all the time. <laughs> Dennis Rodman played his best games after he was He's drunk. wrecked for a weekend. <laughs> so I, I think you've just got to find your own way, like I say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'd like to say I was best that way, but I wasn't. So you got to <laughs> not do it. But sorry. So let's, let's get back to Express Mortgages. So. Obviously, you got through that tough time, and then uh, you know litigation isn't isn't great. But you built your business up, haven't you? You're very successful. You've gone into that kind of, your niche of commercial. I'm right in saying, aren't I? Yeah. What we've tried to do is so we went from residential and buy to let mortgages, and then in about 2015, 2016, because we dealt with so many landlords. Landlords, not all of them buy properties to rent out, uh, or, or they yeah. start off that way, I should say, and then they want to do refurbs or conversions or whatever, or out the ground builds. So we started getting a lot more bridging and development inquiries. And so um, a, a fair amount of our business is now bridging loans, development finance, commercial mortgages. So we have specialists in each area. So we've got the residential and buy-to-let team, we've got the specialist department, and then we've got protection as well. For, for Funny, just touching on that, do you think that's important for people? Especially like guys starting out, they kind of want to do everything, which is mm -hmm. great. Um, but do you think it's kind of a spreading yourself too thinly or do you, do you think specialists are, are, the, are the way forward for, for everyone? I, I do. I favour specialists just because, um, I mean, if you take bridging finance and development finance, there's about 300 lenders. I think it's really difficult to be good, to be exceptional at bridging and development, buy to let mortgages and residential mortgages and be a protection advisor. I just think you've got to be a special human being to be exceptional at all those. I'm not that person. Yeah. so. We, um, Do you know what? Especially with protection, I think so because mm. that's a different skill. At least the other two are the same skill set in regards to negotiation, and understanding. Protection is something completely oh, well, different. You, I always think it's. Um, you listen to our guy Simon, who is amazing. His knowledge is superb. Like you can't. I just don't know how you can advise on that to the degree that he does and do the other. Then a development well. deal. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. We, we just. I also really think it's funny the resi on. resi people. Resi guys are very big on wanting to do bridging because you make more money and that kind of thing. I try to explain to them that like, if you don't know what you're doing, you don't make more money. There's a higher proc for your zero is still zero. Yeah, exactly. You can't, you know, you, you still, you, if you're going to be a specialist in something, you've got to commit to it. You've got to be passionate about it and that kind of thing. I, I think people have got this sort of warped opinion of commercial. Well, talk, talk to me about that, actually, because obviously that's a transition for you. Um, well, how is the like work rate and that kind of thing in regards to commercial? You, you've still got to be very, very busy, haven't you? You still got to know you well, know you're more technical than yeah. I think like our, our best advisor in in the specialist field, Bilal, he's, he's brilliant. Like we we talked about Bilal before, 
Yeah, yeah, I know, but that's good. He just, um, he's got such a good work ethic. And, um, you, you know, in that field, you have to be available for developers. Like, developers might have a challenge on the hands at 7 o'clock at night or at the weekend. And if they can pick yeah. the phone up and get hold of their advisor, you know, they're going to do more and more business with you. So I, I think, especially in that sector, it's good to operate out of hours. Uh, it's not essential, yeah. but it just gives you that edge. So, yeah. Well, we, we, in, in regards to kind of being commercially aware, do you think that's kind of, do you think it's relevant? To that? I mean, not that resi people aren't, but it's it's very different, isn't it, when you're speaking to someone whose business it is? Yeah, I, I think being commercially aware, do you mean like having a good sort of uh, understanding of what's going on in the economy and stuff? Yeah, like how, they make that, how they're making their money and, oh, and their right, margins yeah. and everything like that. So it's a lot different from, because resi is very emotional, isn't it? Because it's, you know, that's your house that you live in and that's the house you love and yada, yada. Whereas, whereas commercial is much more, but commercially driven, you know, so you've got, you've got to have that under, the separate understanding to Resi. Yeah, yeah. And, and as well, remember, we're finance guys, but having a good understanding of construction and development is important. Mm. So knowing what things cost, like if somebody comes to me and says, I can build out this whole development for 80 quid a square foot, and straight away the alarm bells go off in their head. And <laughs> yeah, done if, this before. Yeah. <laughs> if, if people don't know this as an advisor, you'll go, OK, yeah, that's fine. Send in your cost appraisal. So you, you've got like a range that, you know, things should cost. Um, yeah. But ha yeah, having a grasp on the economy, taking an interest in the economy is important. De definitely, you yeah. you're speaking to switched on people. You know, developers are, are, are no mugs. That you know. Yeah. So I, I think it's important to give them that confidence that you know what you're talking about, and that you've got good relationships. Like in bridging and development, relationships are even more important. You know, with with yeah. lenders, like so important because there, there is flexibility. They, they can sort of um, make things more malleable for you you know, to get people yeah. through. And how, how do you deal with the treating customers fairly? I know it's the non-reg side of things, but how do you deal with it? Because you're not speaking to 300 lenders. Um, you know, it's a tough gig. Everyone's got their kind of select. I suppose it's the same as if you're on a panel, but how do you make sure with commercial that you're still doing the right thing? Is it Because it's a completely different regulation to, to Resi. Yeah, it, it is. And, and you're right. I, I'd say out of those 300, you might regularly deal with, what, 20 or... I don't know. Mm. On, on a spreadsheet I passed over the other week to, to one of my colleagues, I think there was 30-odd lenders on there. And there will be more. that There will be skills gaps that we've got, you know, but yeah. that will cover 90%, let's say, of what, what you can help people with. So yeah. I think you've just got to make sure you've got a lender in each in each sector. So I suppose it's like a restricted panel if you're an IFA, as long as you've got covering everything. Yeah, you definitely. Be different you've got to have a covering, and, and some lenders are great up to say two million pound loans. Other lenders won't get out of bed for five million. Um, it's, you, yeah. it's knowing that you've got something for every client. And how do you? How regularly do you kind of keep that update? Because again, you can't have three hundred BDMs in your office. No, know? no. Do you know? We'll, we'll, I'll always. Well, I'm speaking from my own experience, but I know the other guys do it as well. I'll check things like Bridging and Commercial magazine. I'll read all yep. the journals. I'll, if a new lender pops up or a lender that I don't really know much about, I'll just read about them a little bit. I might yep. contact the BDM, just find out if they've got anything that, any USPs that, that we can help our clients with. So it's yep. staying current and it is really important to, to keep in tune with that. That is really relevant. I know, I know Resi is, uh, you still got to stay current and that kind of thing, but you're absolutely right. I think there's too many people that just get the qualification, learn how to do the job and then carry on. And the, the industry changes so quickly, doesn't it? It's, yeah, there's yeah. so much going and, on. And we'll look at our lender spread. Like if you take the yeah. resi and the buy to let side, like last year we, we use, put our business through legal and general mortgage club. So they give us a spread yeah. of like various percentages and stuff. And I think we used 54 lenders last year out of, a, out of about 90 wow. in that market. Yeah. Which is a good amount, you, you know. Good spread, yeah. <laughs> not not many brokers will use 54 lenders, but we get some quirky inquiries in. So it's important that we, um, we we do explore all these avenues. And if it's a small parochial building society, we're, we're checking them out as well. So making sure we've got the best for our clients. But if, say, in bridging and development, I notice that a large percentage of our businesses just go into maybe three or four lenders, I've got to look yeah. at that and decide, are we being a bit lazy here, guys, or what? Yeah, right, yeah. What's yeah. going on? You know, why aren't we exploring these other ones? So that's important. obviously you're going to get those times when some lenders are just giving something incredible. Yeah. But the the majority of it, like you say, is if you've got to be doing. So how do you do that? How do you do? If you're a smaller broker, for how do you do that due diligence? You've obviously been doing it a long time. If you can't, if you can't use experience, what what else? 
I, I think just, they, they, they I, I always put myself in other people's shoes. So I'd, I'd imagine I'm the client and uh, I'm, uh, I'm being offered some examples. D do I just want to see one or two or do, do, you, want, do you want me to talk through more? Um, I, I think you've just got to be very considered of, of your client. And are you honestly, hand on heart, looking in the mirror, uh, exploring every avenue for your client? You know, and if you've yeah. got somebody that's doing a GDV of a million or somebody that's doing a GDV of 20 million, you, you, you've got to really know which lenders operate in, in each sector um, yeah. and, and build relationships accordingly, you know. That makes sense. So go, going back to the growth of the business, so Ed, what, what would you recommend? How did it, obviously you build it back up, up again. Um, so did you, did you build through the litigation time as well? That was still just an ongoing, you're still trying to... No, that, that kind of... Um, between 2015 and 2020, it flatlined around. We got up to about 10, 11 people. And yeah, then, yeah. then it went down to six, actually. It did, uh, it did take a hit uh, in about 2018 and 2019. And then when we could see there was some light at the end of the tunnel, we did start to move up a little bit more. And, and now yeah. today we're, we're at 26. The, the game plan wow. is to get to, unless we, we acquire other brokers, which isn't on the immediate plans, but y you never know. If, if we're growing yeah. by um, referrals, recommendations, introducers, digital marketing, social media, if we're doing that kind of growth, I think we can get to 50 people, including ourselves, within the next two to three years. So we've taken on some more office space to sort of force us into yeah. that. And then, um, yeah, I've, I've got a good friend actually that's in the mergers and, and acquisition space, so maybe he can help us out. To, 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 to <laughs> yeah, really grow. it's much easier. Yeah, no, I'm not good for recruitment, but much easier. M and A is much <laughs> much easier for growth. But it, just in regards to that, so I know you said then you've got bigger office space, and obviously you've got to fix the infrastructure of the business before you before you get there. Talk to me about the kind of stages of getting up to that 26, because that's quite quick from yeah um, 2020 you know that's a that's that's a relatively fast growth did you did you get any bits that were quite shaky or has it all been pretty steady oh yeah very much uh, so we we doubled in about 15 months we got from 12 to 24 and uh, wow. that that part of that was um I, i've got to hold my hand up and say i'm, I'm guilty of like <laughs> t taking a bit of excess risk at times just because it, in my head i just I needed to get like so we've been in litigation we nearly had the company yeah. taken off us yeah of course you did. so my mind is well it nearly all went to shit so why not take the risk what's the worst that can happen <laughs> yeah. um yeah and, and you know you, you have a point to prove when you when you've nearly been buried like that so yeah i wanted mm. to i wanted to double the, the head count and then then it was a bit more stable so we were taking hardly any money out the company you know paying ourselves as little as we could get away with which is a common entrepreneurial story um, I used to look at people that own businesses with 20, 30 staff and think they must be loaded. They're not. Oh, it's, brilliant. It's, not. it's so funny. I was talking to someone about this the other day about how you get paid last, etc. Especially in growth phases, you know, mm. you just, there are bigger things and you can't moan about it as an entrepreneur oh, because no. um, you know the bigger picture. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. It's people, when people see your turnover, for instance, and go, God, you must be doing well. Yeah, but you're spending yeah. your money on recruitment but, fees. On uh, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah. And we're spending it on trying to get... Yeah. <laughs> If you've it's got, a vicious circle, but no, um, exactly, yeah. But it's true, isn't it? But everyone has this. Um, yeah, when I get to this stage, I'll be earning this, yeah. and it's good that people know that when when you're a smaller business, you're probably going to be on a very similar salary for a very long time. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you, you've got to have that bigger picture. You've got to be prepared to take the take the hit. You, you do, and, and Marcus, you'll have heard this before that there's there's people in your business that will earn more money than you, and you've got to be all right yeah, with that yeah. because it happens, yeah. Again, this was yesterday, someone was saying, there's already four people, there's another recruiter actually, he's a good close friend, and he said, there's already four people earning more than me. I said, but they won't forever, and you've got, you know, but, and also, they're, they're making you money, aren't they? But it does happen. Exactly, it's leverage, isn't it? So something I had learned, uh, it was a very powerful message to me a few years back, was just that word leverage. I mean, we've all read it in the yeah. dictionary, haven't we, or in the newspaper, but have it, do you properly like process what that means? And, it, and it's leveraging people, i.e. your team, making sure you've got a good team. Uh, leveraging processes, that's very important uh, in your business. Make sure you've got good systems and processes. And then the third one is leveraging capital. So, um, I mean, we did take out a Siebel's loan when the crap nearly hit the fan over COVID. And um, yeah. that was to protect us just in case. And then we thought afterwards, actually, it didn't hit us as hard as we thought it might have done let's now yeah. grow let's use this to grow so 
those three things I think can really help you take off. Yeah, no, absolutely. And in, in regards to leveraging kind of processes, how conscious of you, have you, did you have like the operations side already? Was that you and your business partner or process wise? Did you just, did it just work out as you went along? Like, oh, that's good. Let's make sure everyone does that. Yeah, or, I, don't, or I, don't think we're, I have to say, I don't think we're particularly organized. Um, we're not one of those business owners that's really ultra organized. So we do need people to help us. And, and this is another key for a lot of people. You, you've got to not be afraid of hiring people cleverer than you uh, yeah. or, or smarter in one aspect. You know, if you've got a skills gap, hold your hand up and say, right, I need help in this area and get somebody on board. So no one of our- Do you know what I've seen? It's so important as well when people say, people will say to us, I just want another me. And I think you've already got a you. you what you really need is someone who's sorting your operations out or what you really yeah. need is someone who does the stuff that you're not good at. Yeah. But the misconception of getting it, oh, if I get another me, will make twice as much. It doesn't, it doesn't and, happen. And it's like, you'll know this, when you're recruiting people, we're all biased towards getting people like ourselves, but you've got to look for yeah. people that are, that are different. You, you know, they might be very, mm. very geeky or have a good IT skill set, or they could be very introverted. And, and if you're more of an extrovert, you know, you might not um, relate to them or whatever, but it's important yeah. if they fit um, a part of the process. So I think that's really important as well for people to notice that. See, sorry for jumping in. Just like it, the business is a bit of a machine. So it doesn't really matter whether they're going to go for a drink with you at the pub. If they fit the business and they fit in that gap that you're missing, that's much more important. You have to look at it like that rather than, you know, you're not employing your mates, are you? You're employing no. something where it fixes a problem in your business. Definitely. And also, don't be afraid to employ people that are going to challenge you. I mean, it's, in fact, it's really mm. important. So um, if somebody's not challenging what I'm saying, I think there's something wrong. Like, I'm not being the leader I can be if, um, if people don't say, hang on a minute, Steve, I disagree with you on that. And, and if yeah. somebody said that to me, I'd be like, brilliant, right, tell me, tell me about it, tell me a little bit more. Because like, yeah. I'm programmed to think one way and, and somebody's thinking a slightly different way and that's gonna be... Yeah, yeah, I think as well, if you know that, if you've employed them on that, you know, again, funny enough, conversation the, the other day, no one's trying to annoy you, no, and they, people don't think the same, so it doesn't matter. No one is saying it to be awkward. It's a genuine concern because they might be more emotionally intelligent or they yeah. might be more, you know, they, they might be more analytical than you. Yeah. But if you don't have that in the team, you're right. You're, every idea you've got is brilliant because everyone agrees with you and then all of a sudden you've fallen down a really awful path of just you, all your decisions because no one's, no one's challenged you on it because everyone is like you. So I think you have to, everyone has to be aware of that. Yeah, so. yeah. I think the, the ultimate job of, of the, the, the head or the leader is, is to paint the picture, the vision and... Uh, you know, convey that, verbalise that vision to people and make sure people buy into it, make sure they believe it as much as, or as nearly as much as you do. And then, yeah. then you'll have a powerful team and then make sure that you create leaders within your organisation to lead others because, you, you know, you can't be the sole leader. You want to create a series of leaders w within the company. How have you done that? How, how, that, how interest, out of that kind of 26, how do you see them when you're interviewing them or is it something that comes along maybe organically later on, how do you get those leaders into the business? Sometimes you see it in people, other times you, you don't, and it develops over time, I think. Mm. Um, yeah, it's something that you've got to nurture a little bit. But uh, yeah. I think when you'll know this playing rugby, you, you, you've got people on the field and great communicators and stuff like that. And being part of a team, I think that's really helps us in, in the company, in the business. Um, yeah, yeah it re re really helps us because it's not just about you, it's about you know, your other 14 men or 12 men, depending on which game you play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that does make sense. So what do you look for at your brokers? What is it? Have you got like a, a set of characteristics that you think these are successful? Have you, have you employed enough people now that you've kind of got the formula that these guys work? Or is it, is it, still, is it still a bit different for everyone? Do, do you know the hardest thing I, I find to, to work out in somebody is their work ethic. That, that's the, that's the mm. hardest thing. And, and because I've always believed in having a strong work ethic, you know, I'd have milk round as a kid, etc. Uh, it, it's something that I really, I really respect and value. I think you, you might not have the talent or the skill set, you might need to work at something, but if you've got a strong work ethic, you know, that for me, that's key. So yeah, I, w yeah. I wish I could figure that out. Um, <laughs> It's hard, yeah. Do you know what? We, well, there are ways of doing it in the competency-based stuff, but it's it's it is the toughest thing. Will and skill, because mm -hmm. you can test someone's skill all day long. Yeah. Um, will is very difficult, and obviously you've got to pick will over skill because if you're the most amazing person in the world, won't pick up the phone. It's not, you know, 
that it doesn't work. So yeah, hundred I hundred percent buy into the the you know they've got to be willing. Yeah, and that's that that is work I think. Yeah. But, um, certain things yeah, it's like, a tough competency to test. Yeah, the, I mean, there's certain things like, um, like for us, because we use so many lenders, if we're taking on a new advisor, um, what's your experience like? What's your, what's your knowledge like? You know, who have you used before? But that's not the be all and end all. Again, if they've got the right attitude, that, that comes first. Yeah. But in an ideal world, they'd, they'd have used your CRM system before, you know, they'd uh, be yeah. great communicators, um, they'd have a good knowledge base, they'd be a good closer. You know, I think sometimes we underestimate this is a sales role. You, you know, people hide behind the fact that I'm an advisor, I'm a consultant. No, you're a bloody salesperson. You know, yeah, yeah. you've got to be able to get on with people. You've got to be able to ask the right questions. You've got to know when to shut up. All these things are so important. And then when you need to, well, it's a series of mini closes along the way, isn't it? But then when it comes to the end and you ask for the business, it should be a no-brainer that that client says, yeah, where, where do I sign? It's interesting. You're right. I, we, I spoke to a broker the other day who said the same thing. We've got a fantastic advisor who's so technically, and this is in the high net worth commercial space, similar to yourself. Um, he's so intent on getting the guy the be get every, everyone the best deal, showing his technical knowledge that he loses out because he doesn't actually close someone. And sometimes these commercial guys want something now. Yeah. So if he comes back and says, "I've saved you 0.05 percent," and the guy will say, "Well, sorry, I've already given it to so and so because they just came along and said this is what you need to do. Do it now." Yeah. And they bought into them, so it's not that you're not particularly good at relationship building or anything like that. And it, I do think people overthink it because they want to do a good job. Yeah. But you're right; you've got to close. You know, you just don't, you, yeah. And, and most you've people still got need, to make money. Most people need guiding. It, this it's quite a complex industry. You know, it taught me something when I sent a KFI out, uh, Key Facts Illustration, to uh, yep. to a smart guy, clearly a smart guy who's in, in working in the city in London in, in a high powered um, legal position, uh, earning several hundred thousand a year. So, you know, by virtue of that fact, he's going to be pretty smart. And when he turned mm -hmm. around to me one day and said, um, he interpreted the KFI wrong. You know that cost for every pound borrowed? Yeah, yeah. He got that bit wrong, and, and, I, and I had to just, like, help him with that. And then that said to me that if somebody like him has interpreted this illustration wrong... You don't know what you don't know, do you? What, what hope is there for, like, the average person on the street, you know? So, yeah, yeah it's... Um, you, people do need guiding, they do need the hand-holding, and also, don't be afraid to like suggest, like come up with options, but then go, well, I actually think this is the best because of X, Y, Z. Yeah. Do you know what, I, we have the similar conversations with people, people that genuinely want to partner with you when they say, uh, and I say, okay, what do you need? And he's, that, they are like, well, you tell us, because, you know, I don't do my own legal documents, I don't do my own accounts. So why am I going to tell you what I need for recruitment? We'll tell you about our business, and that's the way. And it's much the same for you guys when you're broken a deal. We'll tell you about the deal, mm. and you broke it. You know that's that's your job, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it, it makes yeah. sense. Just relying on the person, but then you know that trust, I suppose, is is, is um is key because someone's got to trust you to do that as well. Yeah, yeah, de definitely. But I guess what, one of the challenges for a lot of brokers out there, you, you know, if there's them or just them and one other person, and do they want to go through the headache of of recruiting people and growing a business? You, you I guess a, a piece of advice I can think of would be to, to not be afraid of letting go and um, mm. not to try and control everything. You know, it, it's hard to do that when, when you're... The hardest thing, I think, yeah. from from broker to manager, or, you know, is it's, it's such a hard transition. Yeah. Because you know how you make money. Yeah. It's the same for every business, yeah. not just brokers, all business owners. You know how you've always fed your kids. Yeah. So yeah. to give that up for someone else to do it and you to... Helicopter is a tough, you know, it's tough for anyone. It, it, all small business owners feel the same, don't they? It's, yeah. It's the, um, yeah. nobody wants to relinquish that at first. No. But you can't grow without it. You can't grow if you're doing everything. No, and none of us really want to be micromanaged, do we? So why, why would you, why would you, your staff or your team member want to be micromanaged? So you've, yeah. it, it's a real test of self-control, I think that. But over time... I, you, I love the fact that you're using micromanagement in the right way as well, because I speak to so many people that assume it's, uh, especially, <laughs> without being sound like an old man again, there's a new generation of people that be like, I feel like I was micromanaged. And they explain it to me and I say, no, that's being managed. Yeah. Micromanaged yeah. is when you actually take stuff off of people yeah. because you don't trust yeah. them with it. Yeah. There's a massive difference yeah. between, oh, I always felt like they're always watching me. Well, they are because you've got to hit certain KPIs to make a business successful. Yeah. That's not micromanagement. So you're right. Micromanagement is when you can't physically release or trust someone enough to, to run with yeah, your business. Yeah, that's which it. Is, you, you've, given, so you've given them some tasks to do. You're breathing down the neck, looking over the shoulder every five minutes. Um, and or you're um, 
you, you're giving them that responsibility yet you're you're doing the job anyway because you, you feel that you can do a better yeah, job yeah, or <laughs> the, the frustrating thing is that no one is going to love your business as much as you so there is always going to be an element of god i know i can do that but you can't you can't run everything if you want to grow a business like you said, it's detrimental to just micromanage and, and not relinquish some responsibility to other people. Yeah, de definitely. Yeah, but, but it depends on your motivation. Some people don't ever want to do that, and that's totally fine. It's not that success and this isn't. You, you've got to really want to do it, I think. You've got to sometimes have a bit of a bee in your bonnet about something or a chip on your shoulder or whatever it may be. But if, if you have that desire to grow a company, uh, and ideally it's not about the money because the money will be a byproduct anyway, you know, you, yeah. you get to, and you can make money as a one-man band. You can do that very happily. Oh yeah, crack on, yeah. and you know, it's not like you don't become a multi-millionaire overnight because you've got a couple of employees. No, no, no. But uh, if if there's other things, if you've got a bigger vision or a reason to do it that's greater than money, then that's that's the yeah. best because you'll, you know, like I say, the money's going to come anyway. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, if you're good at it, it just it does. I, I think that vision, like you just said, then the, the vision's really important. And then you have to sell that vision to someone else. But I, I think it also stick, you stick out like a sore thumb if you're not really buying into what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. You know, lots of people say, I want this, and really they just don't want to work as hard anymore because running a business is hard. Yeah, yeah. I don't think, it doesn't, you don't see that enough on social media. Um, you know, it all looks great, doesn't it? Because we're all fantastic and we all, we put on our highlights oh, and that kind of thing. But I know, I know. It's tough, you know? But we resonate with the posts sometimes that are really authentic and real and where somebody mm. tells about a challenge or a problem that they've had. Because I think, like, we all face them, don't we? So um, yeah. it's nice to hear somebody else's challenges because you think you're not on your own. I, th I, I agree. I, I'm very blessed that I get to speak to business owners every day. So I know everyone has the same problems. But when you're insular in your business mm. you just and you're having a tough time, you don't really know that other people are having a tough time. You just assume that... Everyone else is smashing it because that's what they're writing. Yeah, yeah. But with, with the, you touch on the social game there, Marcus. I think that uh, it's mm -hmm. quite a new era, this, isn't it, with, with social media? And, uh, yeah. Putting yeah, we're slightly more exposed to each other now, aren't we? And I think a little bit more. Not, not, you can show your vulnerable side, if you like, without, um, you know, to, or to, to help others. Yeah. I think it's a little bit different now than it, maybe a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But we, we hear it with our team as well. A lot of people are afraid to get on camera, and, and I totally get it. You know, I, I wasn't, yeah. I didn't have any acting training or, you know, it was all new to me a few years back. But I, again, I just took it as, I, I thought of the bigger picture. I, I began with the end in mind and, and thought, well, what, what do I want with all this? What's the plan? And, and of course, you're going to get people that, um, you'll get people that encourage you, people that will think you're a, a knob. <laughs> yeah. um, I, don't, I never see those ones yet. I, feel, I don't think I'm, a, I'm controversial enough. I'm, all, I'm still waiting for the trolls to keep telling me I'm a dickhead on the... Uh, on the comments, but I suppose it's because I'm on LinkedIn, it's a little bit different. I suppose if I was on TikTok, I'd be, uh, yeah. I'd be nailed every five minutes. <laughs> but the, the reality is you don't get that much of it. And, and when you do, it's just like, so what? You know what? I, they're not your customers, are they? They're not your target no, market. No, and, and you know, we don't want to work with dickheads. So if they're going to be here, it's not the end of the world. No, but you just take the moral high ground and you can use it to your advantage when you get some like negativity like that. And then the other people that are kind of looking at your stuff, looking at your work, will, will rally around you, not them. Yeah. So... It's not necessarily a bad thing, but no, I think that um, predominantly, like 99% of the time, there's none of that anyway. And um, yeah. you're just putting yourself out there, you're promoting your business. And uh, if you work for somebody else, you're promoting yourself, your brand. And uh, it, it does bring a lot of business in, so it's a no brainer. Can I, I would like to point something out to people about your social media as well. And if you're not linked into Steam and you're listening, I would highly recommend you do, especially in the space because. I think brokers make a massive error. I don't know other industries, so I don't know if this is across the board. But a lot of brokers seem to post stuff that about other brokers or about their job that isn't relevant to their clients, whereas your stuff is focused on the people that you work with, your client base. You talk about your client's problems. You show you showcase your client's solutions. Um, that's obviously a conscious decision, but talk to me about that because it just seems like, and obviously I'm connected to thousands of brokers, mm -hmm. a lot of them use social media to talk to other mortgage brokers and it, it blows my mind because i don't care about other recruiters i care about mortgage brokers because they're my target market so yeah. and you obviously do the same that's what i mean that's what sparked off our initial conversation about but yeah i, th I think what do, what do you think that is i i just i go on this basis that i come from a place of service so i'm i'm there to help my my audience and um you know, I, I know there's a lot of challenges that developers have two of the biggest ones are finding the deals and finding the money and um, yeah. if I can help them with case studies of other developers without giving detail away, uh, you know, I can 
I can help them with a challenge or if they're struggling for loan to value or whatever it may be, then uh, I can show them that, hey, we've, we've helped with a case like that before. Um, yeah. You know, we deal with investors as well as developers and, and there's a bit of a marrying up process at times. Uh, and showing them um, possibility. I, I like, I, generally, when I speak at events, it, it's about the possibility and, uh, and inspiring people and, and that kind of thing because I think a lot of people get stuck and trapped in their, their world, which is, you know, if they want to be in the next division. This is what we do. This is what we do. And actually, no one cares what you do. They, they, they care about the problem that you're solving yeah. for them. Yeah. But I, maybe that's what it is. I think people, people, people want to show how knowledgeable they are as well. So I think that some of it comes from that. But actually, no one cares. Yeah. Maybe no. what they care about is their problem. Yeah, definitely. And and, uh, and it's like, how can you help me? What's your goals and aims? How can you help me get there? So um, that that's what is, is at the forefront of my mind to, to, to help people with. Amazing. And I, I hope people take note of that as well, because it's so important, especially when you're starting out. I mean, you should have some sort of strategy anyway, but the the pain points of your customers is the most important thing you can talk about because oh, yeah. that's why people use us. That's why people, you know, people want us to solve their problems. So talk about them. Don't talk about your problem with how long the, or you're on hold to sad them there for. No one cares. No, exactly. <laughs> oh, good. Um, so I've kept you for ages, Steve. I really, really appreciate your time. So I can, I will finish off. If you could give one tip to any new aspiring brokers, perhaps either going into the self-employed market or going into starting a brokerage where they plan to scale, what would it be? What would what would be the big um, a big tip that you could give them? Um, I, I would say you, you've got to you've got to have a big enough sufficient reason why why you're doing what you're doing. I, I think, and, and if like I come back to that thing about the money, when you've not got money or not much of it, you, you think that that's the end thing, and it's like that will yes. come. Trust me. So you, you've just got to um, you've got to stand out. So what's going to make you stand out in your industry? So for, like for yeah. us, for example, two things I bang on about is first class customer service and then being experts at what we do, hence the specialization thing. Yeah, I, yeah. I think if I keep banging the drum about that and then we move forward with that in mind, we're, we're going to become great. We're going to become like yeah. it might not. And you prove it. You just get better and you prove it and then you get better and you prove it. And then yeah. It's just constant. I, I would say that. And also be, be patient because it, it might not happen on your timing. You know, uh, it, it might be it might be 10 years. It might be 15. It might be five. You, you, you just don't know. But if you if you wake up each day excited about what you do, then that's half the battle. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. So be great and be patient are the two two uh, two big takeaways, I think. And I, the, the patience thing is huge because everyone wants, you know, especially in, the, in a world of instant gratification, um, you know, building business takes time. Uh, so it, it's uh, it's great to hear that from you. Um, thank you, everyone listening on Spotify and watching on YouTube. I really appreciate um, everyone listening. And thank you, Steve, for your time. Genuinely, it's been really useful. Um, we will get all of your socials and all of the ways to contact you. If anyone wants to call you, I'm sure there'll be some questions and I'll pass them on to you. Um, and we will leave it there. I thought it was good. Brilliant. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Lovely. Cheers, Steve. Speak to you soon.